Thank you. Good morning. My name is Steve. Hi. It's good to see you. That's, you know, that's nice. That's nice. Look, cheers up here, you know? Like, although I told you my name, maybe you don't know my name. But anyway. All right. Yes, my name is Steve. It is Advent. And uh, today, I'm going to be reading to you from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, starting in verse 31. It says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, uh, for the last few months, we've been considering from all sorts of different angles what it means to be called by God, to be given a vocation from him, and how to live and move and have our being in this world as ones who are sent by God. And over the last few weeks, we've considered how our various callings manifest themselves in the various roles that we inhabit, like singleness or parenting. And today, we're going to consider how we live out our calling in marriage. But before we get into that text, we have to talk about some of the misconceptions of marriage that our culture holds and that we imbibe daily, because by and large, our culture does not understand what marriage is from the biblical perspective. And I'm not being antagonistic here. I'm not saying, oh, they, sh they how would they know? Otherwise, if we didn't tell them. So, so let me, let me try to dispel some misconceptions. Um, Tim Keller, uh, in his book on, the, uh, on marriage, uh, has a great, says it very well in his first couple of chapters. He says that our culture's main understanding is that marriage is like a relational contract, right, between two people. And I sign that contract in order to fulfill my own desires and goals. That's largely the the common understanding of marriage. I meet a person, she makes me feel really good. I love her. I have desires to be married and have children, companionship, start a family, and so I marry her in order to achieve those goals for me. And in that way, my role and my spouse's role are like two leeches that get attached to each other. And at some point, the nourishment is going to end. The feeling of being love, in love will fade. She is no longer helping me to achieve my goals of happiness. In fact, she's antagonizing my goals of happiness because she's making me miserable. She no longer fulfills my goals, so let us divorce and find someone else to latch on to. And we usually don't use the language that I just used. That's not... <laughs> It's putting it a finer point on it than we normally put on it. Normally, um, what we, the language that we use is that of being in love. This is why we marry. Now, far be it for me to disparage the feeling of being in love. It is fantastic, no doubt, of course, yes. But at the end of the day, it is just a feeling. Our culture has built a temple around this feeling, and we learn to worship there through thousands of sentimental songs and books and novels and movies and television shows. We, we understand what that means. We use this feeling as the basis for marriage, and probably for very good reason, because when lovers are in the throes of love, it compels us to make promises to one another, right? Like, I will, oh, I feel this, and I will, oh, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll swim across the ocean, climb the high, you know. In, in that feeling, it's like, I am not satisfied with this until I pledge myself in undying fidelity to you. That's what it makes us do. But as we all know, that feeling doesn't last, nor was it intended to, nor would it be good for us if, we, if it did. Like, if you've ever been in that state, imagine if your whole life was lived there. How would you work? How would you sleep? 
How would you engage in any other relationship? It's not good (laughs) to stay there. It's so consuming. So our culture seems to believe that marriage is the place where we will forever experience that feeling that we had when we first met this person. In fact, um, C.S. Lewis said it, wrote somewhere, I can't remember where, but he said um, that when we hear the words, and they lived happily ever after, what we do is we interpret that to mean, and they felt the same way about each other always. I mean, I'm just telling you these things. I don't think I have to persuade you. This is true, right? And if the feeling ceases, then we consider that a breach of contract and thus grounds for dissolving it. Now, none of this is a way to make a sustainable marriage, nor does any of it come close to what the Bible teaches us about marriage, which is far more glorious and at the same time, far more mundane. But if we're able to see for what God designed marriage, then we can appeal to him for the power to live as spouses to one another in the image of Christ. So, with all that as set up, now, in order to do that, let's look at this text under three headings. Number one, what is marriage for? Number two, what does marriage mean? And then number three, in light of those two things, how do we live in marriage? So what is marriage for? What does it mean? And how do we live within a marriage out of our calling. Now, number one, what is marriage for? Uh, In Ephesians 5, Paul's been explaining, right before our text comes, he's explaining the different, how the different members of the ancient household are to live together as a result of the redemption that has been purchased in Christ's blood. And he spends a great deal of time talking about husbands and wives, but we're not going to focus on the specifics there. Let's just consider the climax of the argument in verse 31. It says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, if you've read your Bibles, you know these are not Paul's words. He's actually quoting for us the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 24. In order, in, in order to understand what marriage is for, Let's go back to that passage and get the larger context. So let's start in Genesis, let's back up a little bit. Start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a, I will make a helper fit for him. Now, if you've ever read these first two chapters of Genesis, you know how profoundly shocking it is to hear those words It is not good. For six days of creation, God has been speaking worlds into existence, and with each new creation, we hear the refrain of the song, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. It was good. It was good. It was very good. Seven times God speaks this benediction over his creation. It is good. It is good. And each new portion of the creation adds a new strain of harmony to the song of God's beatitude, which blesses all that he has made. And then at the very crescendo, the movement to which the song has been building the entire time, the release for which all the tension has been built is destroyed when he says, it is not good. So what is not good in all that God has created? He says, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now that is a strange turn in the symphony. Like we've witnessed, like, okay, think back to Genesis chapter one. We have witnessed how God creates. The work is not difficult for him. He just speaks and things are formed. Every portion of creation complements the other as pieces of a grand puzzle fitting together. And then all of a sudden, it's not good? What happened? Like, did God as the master builder all of a sudden make a wrong cut? Did the composer scribble notes on the page which were in the wrong key? 
Well, no. <laughs> if we're to believe what Genesis 1 says about his power to create with ease and his wisdom to create with harmony, then that cannot be the case. The only possible answer is that God did it this way to leave something not good, that he did it that way in order to increase the tension of the story and to make all of us who are witnessing the, the narrative unfold cry out, how will he resolve this? How will he complete the goodness? And I say that because what comes next God is simply drawing out. He didn't say, it's not good that the man should be alone. Let me fix that. Instead, there's this whole thing. Verse 19, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the li every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a suitable helper fit, there was not a helper found fit for him. Like, solve the problem. No, we're going to name some stuff first. <laughs> so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's the part that Paul pulls out. But now that we have the context, we understand a little bit more about what's going on. So after God had flung the stars into the sky, after God had set galaxies into their celestial motion, after God had called the snow-capped mountains to rise up out of the rocks, after God had caused the oceans to spring forth from the deep, he said, the work is not yet complete. The work was only completed in the marriage of the man and the woman. So in that way, marriage is the completion of creation, the crescendo of the great symphony that God was writing in the beginning. So with all of that established, Let's answer our question. What is marriage for? Well, first of all, think of the problem that marriage solved. Namely, that the man was alone. Right? That, that's, that's the problem. God himself said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Therefore, the most fundamental purpose of human marriage is companionship. It's a relationship established by the creation of God in which we are no longer alone in this world. Now, let me hasten to um, remind you that singleness is in every way blessed by the scriptures. Yes, Matt taught us that a couple of weeks ago, and if you want to know about that, you can go listen to that sermon, but I'm not talking about singleness. I'm talking about marriage, okay? So I just, I, I'm gonna have to continue to caveat everything I'm saying because I know that we're not, I don't have a monolithic group of people in front of me. We're all coming from very different uh, walks of life. And so, uh, but just so you know, I, I'm talking about marriage. I, I'm not talking about all the other things. I'm just talking about marriage. Okay, now, the way the scripture answers this question, what is marriage for? is to tell us that marriage is, first and foremost, about solving the problem of being alone. Or to say it another way, marriage is for companionship. The two become one flesh, is what this, the word says. Notice that it does not say that marriage is for being in love. <laughs> uh, what we call being in love is a feeling. Feelings change. Marriage is for companionship and for no longer being alone. And if you survey a thousand couples who've been married a long time, every one of them will say that companionship only comes 
after the fury of all the passion in the beginning fades. And that companionship is far more satisfying than that flurry of chemicals assaulting your brain when you first meet somebody. Ask any married couple who have entered the blessings of companionship and they will tell you that this blessing far outstrips any of the blessings those first, of those first days of passion. Like I, me, personally, I would not give two nickels to return to those heady days of being in love, great as it was, but I would give my life rather than lose the companionship that has replaced it. And do you know why? Because that's what marriage was made for. And, number two, it was made to last for life. That's what it means when it says that the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast or cleave to his wife. The same term is used in the first five books of the Bible to talk about Israel's fidelity to the Lord. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and there's the word, hold fast to him. And by his name, you shall swear. This is the, con this is the concept of covenant fidelity to the Lord. And when does that fidelity end? When does the Lord say, I'm done with you? When does he say to his people, you may serve me for a certain amount of time, and then you can leave? Never. It's forever. Genesis 2 is teaching us that in marriage, we hold fast to our spouse in the same manner in which the Lord hold fa holds fast to us and that we hold fast to the Lord, which is to say, always. Now, of course, here's some more caveats. Um, the Bible does give us biblical avenues for divorce. That is true. But in every case... I am sure in every case, and perhaps the divorced among us can witness to this, divorce in the Bible is seen less as, a, as the dissolving of a contract and more like the cutting up of a body. It's, it's painful. It's filled with grief. And why? It's because marriage was made as the permanent environment of lifelong companionship. And when that is broken, it is as if the created order is falling apart. Do you see that? Marriage, human marriage, is the crescendo of creation. And when it falls apart, when it dissolves, something in the cosmos is not right. It's like the mountains have been swallowed by the sea. It was not meant to be that way. Again, I'm not commenting on divorce here. I'm teaching on marriage and its purposes in the sight of God. I know that there are legitimate biblical reasons for divorce, but that is not my topic. So as you hear me making these claims about marriage, please, please just have charity. Don't read into it some sort of like divorce shaming. Uh, it's not what I'm doing. It's not what I'm doing. I know it's painful, and I know there are complex reasons. So all that to say, the most fundamental purpose of marriage is lifelong companionship. And if you're wondering what your role is in marriage, then you cannot get more fundamental than that. To be a companion to your spouse. To ensure that your spouse is not alone in this world. And the various means by which that happens are as varied as the hundreds of millions of uh, married people on this planet. And so, regardless, you can be sure of this, that you and your spouse belong to one another. You have been given to one another by God in order that you may not be alone. And if your spouse has proven unwilling to fulfill that role, it's a tragic mockery of the creation order. And yet you, by the power of the spirit who dwells in you, may fulfill that role for them, dying to yourself as Christ 
and died for you. Okay, now, that's how the Bible answers what marriage is for. Now, let's turn the corner, number two, and ask the question, what does marriage mean? So Paul has quoted Genesis 2 to make his point about marriage, but then he goes on in the next verse to bring his teaching about marriage into the heavenly realms. He says in verse 32 of Ephesians 5, this mystery, the mystery of human marriage, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So first of all, he says, marriage is a mystery. Now, when we hear the word mystery, we kind of think of it as a puzzle that is difficult to solve. But that is not what the Bible means by this word. It's not what Paul means when he uses the word mystery. In fact, in the letter to Ephesians, Paul uses this word more in this letter than he uses it anywhere else. In chapter 1, he talks about the mystery of God's will, which includes the redemption of Christ through his shed blood on the cross, the forgiveness of our sins, the adoption that we have been given into his family, and God's ultimate plan to unite all things in Christ at the end of the ages. This, all of this that I just mentioned, Paul says, this is the mystery of God's will. And then in chapter 3, he talks about how the Jews and the Gentiles, through the reconciling blood of Christ, are made into one family. And that is a great mystery, Paul says. The mystery now that the Jews and the Gentiles are going to become one family is now revealed. So taken together, we can see that mystery for Paul is not a puzzle that needs solving. Rather, in Paul's lexicon, mystery is a reality that could not be figured out by human ingenuity. But it is a reality that must be revealed by God. Okay, that's what Paul means by mystery. Not something, it's something that human ingenuity could not figure out on its own, but something that must be revealed by God. Nobody could have figured out that God intended to send the Messiah into the middle of history in order to die for his people. Like that had to be revealed. Nobody could have figured out that Jews and Gentiles will be made into the family of God by the atoning work of Christ's sacrifice. That had to be revealed. Like no matter how well the ancient Jews knew their scriptures, those are things they could not have figured out. Like now, today, we look back on those Old Testament scriptures, we're like, oh yeah, and the, because Jesus taught us, this fulfills this, and this is, and the, it's like, but no, that has been revealed. The ancient Jews could never have figured that out on their own. It was a profound mystery. It didn't matter how much they knew the scriptures, no matter how much of it dwelt in their memories, there are mysteries to God's will that cannot be searched out. They must be revealed. Okay. And added to the great mysteries of Christ's redemption and the assembling of the family of God in their eternal habitation, Jews and Gentiles, in addition to all of those grand mysteries, like the whole plan of redemption of God, from before, from, from eternity past into the eternity future, like the whole redemption of God, this is classified as a mystery. The Jews and the Gentiles in one family classified as a mystery. And now add to that marriage. <laughs> Human marriage. It's astonishing. Your marriage is a mystery of redemption. Now again, don't hear in the word mystery a puzzle to be solved, although God knows that's true. But your marriage has a meaning, listen, your marriage has a meaning that can only be revealed by God. No amount of searching the scriptures or puzzling it out could have helped any of us arrive at this meaning. We had to be told by revelation what our marriage means. Okay, so what does it mean? Paul says, I am saying that your marriage refers to Christ and the church. Not only that, but 
of all the times in this letter that Paul speaks about the mystery of God's will now being revealed, this is the only time, when he's speaking about marriage, this is the only time that he attaches an adjective to it. Human marriage refers to Christ in the church, he says, and this is a great mystery. This is a profound mystery. Like, I don't have time to comment on that, but the the plan of God to send his son to die for sins and make a family out of Jews and Gentiles who are natural enemies, like, that's a mystery. Your marriage, it is a profound mystery. (sighs) Okay. Now, it's like when he comes to marriage, he just has to sit down, he has to catch his breath like this is a, a great mystery. So we've already seen what God intended for human marriage on a strictly physical level, strictly you know, human level, namely companionship. And here we see Paul teaching us something new, namely that marriage is also a witness to the eternal truths of Christ and his church. So let's figure out what that means that our marriages refer to Christ in the church. First, and by the way, this means so many things. I can only comment on a couple. First, marriage is the context in which we learn mutual submission to one another. The heading over this whole section in Ephesians chapter 5 occurs in verse 21, in which Paul explains that those who are filled with the Spirit are those who, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence, reverence for Christ. Now, there isn't another relationship that I know of that requires its members to learn submission and compromise and humility more than marriage. And as, the, and, and as the husband and the wife learn this difficult posture, the mystery of Christ and his church will be revealed, will be made plain to the world. How so? What, what truth is this mutual submission to one another telling about Christ and his church? Well, think about it. Jesus submitted himself to the people of this world, Right? Paul describes this beautifully in Philippians chapter 2. He says in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And after Jesus, the bridegroom, submitted himself in this way, the natural consequence, right, is that his people, his bride, will submit herself to him. Paul goes on, verse 9, Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, as we learn to submit to one another in what is perhaps the most intense human relationship that many of us will ever know, that mutual submission is a witness to the mystery of Christ and his purposes for all of eternity. So, our mutual submission witnesses to the great truths about Christ in his church. The second thing it means is that our marriage refers to Christ in the church, what that means that our marriage refers to Christ in the church has to do with the permanence of the relationship that I mentioned before. When we stand before a congregation and make our vows, we are in essence pledging to one another that we will never leave each other. We will never forsake each other. And this, of course, refers to Christ and his church. In John's gospel, Jesus speaks of his people like this. John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. In other words, I, Jesus says, will never forsake my people. Though the armies of hell advance against them, though all the world fall away, yet I have my people in my hand, and I will never let them go. His last words in the Gospel of Matthew are similar. He says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Behold, I am with you always. How long? To the end of the age. And so as we, in marriage, commit ourselves to one another, we promise fidelity. And as we hold fast to our spouse and never let them go, we are telling the world a great mystery about Christ and his church. Now, I could go on and on about the different ways that our marriages witness to Christ and his church, but my time is short, so let me move on, finally, to some application. Number three, how are we to live in marriage given these realities? In other words, what is our role? as spouses. First, we must give ourselves as companions to our spouses. And if my immediate reaction is, what about my wife? What about my husband? What, what about them? They don't give themselves to me as a companion. They have left me deeply and bitterly alone. And I confess, that is a difficult road to travel. Full stop. But as Christians, the object of our imitation is Christ, not other people. Christ gave us his companionship at the cost of his life. And he did this while we were still his enemies. Not while we had warm feelings toward him. Now, I don't pretend to know all the complications in the marriages represented here, and I don't mean to sound simplistic. But if you are still married, even if your marriage has crumbled to a condition that feels beyond repair, there are appropriate ways in which you can offer your companionship to your spouse and thus tell the truth about Christ and his church. Number two. Don't load too much freight on the witness of your marriage. Don't load too much freight on the witness of your marriage. Let me explain. Um, when we are first married, or even just like in the phase when we're contemplating marriage, you know, many of us have an urge to counteract every negative thing that we have inherited from our own parents' marriages, or in a lot of cases, their divorce. We desire to fully contradict in our own marriages the witness that we've inherited from the previous generation. We are going to love each other. We are going to communicate honestly and without hindrance. <laughs> Sorry, I laugh, I laugh. Um, we're gonna raise our children right, not like we were raised, and on and on. Every failure whose negative consequence we experienced, we will make right in our marriage. And look, I commend that desire. I identify with it deeply, yes. But after a while, you'll likely discover what we all discover over time, namely, that whatever eraser we think we've been given to blot out the marks is not big enough. And even if we were able to still... You can still see the marks after you've erased them. You've spent your whole life trying your hardest. You can still see the, the pencil marks on the paper. Just by the act of joining two sinners into a marriage, we fail our marriage just by entering it. And so my wife and I have been convinced to take the generational approach to the witness of our marriage. We are committed to the witness of how our marriage tells the truth or fails to tell the truth about Christ and his church, but that is a story that unfolds over generations. 
We both come from divorced families, and we've decided that instead of trying to do everything with our marriage, instead of trying to erase all the marks in our marriage, to tell all the truth about Christ in the church, we just want to tell one truth. Namely, that Christ will never leave nor forsake his bride. We reckon that if we can stay married until we die, Lord help us. That wasn't a sarcastic remark. I mean, it's, it's, really, I mean, love you, honey. All right, now, we reckon, but seriously, we need, we need, anyway, okay. Can I, let me just finish this now. We reckon that if we can stay married until, that, until we die, then our children will at least have that to build on in their own marriages. And maybe with that as a foundation, they can go on to tell yet greater truths about Christ and his church in their marriages. And then their children will build yet higher upon that foundation. Now, to be clear, I mean, you know, in order to stay together, we have to do all the things, right? We, we have to submit to one another. We have to be each other's companions for sure. But still, we have taken the generational view of marriage and its witness of Christ in the church, to Christ in the church. And again, please don't hear me casting down those of us who have gotten divorced. I'm not doing that. Marriage is not the only way we come to learn those great truths about Christ, about Christ and his fidelity to the church and all the other mysteries that are contained in the gospel. Like, I came from lots of divorce. It's a recreational sport in my family. And yet, I have found myself in the ocean of these great mysteries swimming diving down to the deeps and loving them. Third, and finally, when any of these callings become inordinately difficult, we have to remind ourselves of the true meaning of marriage. In fact, it's not too much to say. I, I'm not exaggerating here. It is not too much to say that the meaning of the entire redemptive story, the entire history of God's redemptive work is marriage. It is written that one day Christ will return in the fullness of his glory and he will raise all the people from the dead. He will call them from their tombs and then he will usher us into his everlasting kingdom. And then do you know what's going to happen? Well, if you've read Revelation 19, you know, starting in verse 6, it says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and the sound, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is the end of history, the marriage supper supper of the lamb this is what our human marriages are anticipating and witnessing to and if that's true like if that's true and you let that in for a second it could almost lead us into exasperation with God like why did you choose such a weak and crumbling vessel as human marriage to witness to the world about the marriage that ties all the threads of human history together. Why this? But who are we to question the wisdom of God? He has delighted to put within brittle jars of clay the most glorious cargo imaginable. And the more it breaks and crumbles, the more we long for the true marriage to arrive when we shall see the bridegroom at the head of the table and we, we, when we shall at last be contented in the love of our true companion who will never leave us and will never forsake us, world without end. 
Now, that may seem like, um, in the season of Advent, a very strange topic to consider. And yet, this marriage supper, this is what we await. We await that table where we can sit with our Lord, the bride with the bridegroom. And that is what this meal represents. Thomas Watson once said that when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are tasting God in his cheer. The bridegroom awaits. And we, in the season of Advent, wait. How long, O oh Lord? And yet he has given us bread and a cup so that if you want to know what the cheer of your bridegroom tastes like while we wait, we have it. So, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, our hearts are, our hearts soar when we think of what you have given to us in marriage. And we pray, Father, that you would grant us the grace to uh, be awakened to the, to the realities that you have packed into this, the mysteries that you have unfolded within our marriages. We confess, and we are the first to confess, that these mysteries that you intend to communicate are not in good hands. <laughs> we... We fail so very constantly, and yet, and yet this is your pleasure. This is your goodwill. And so would you grant us the grace, fill us with your spirit, so that by our marriages, we may both be companions and speak the truth about Christ and his church. In the name of Jesus, amen. Here we come now to the table of God, to the table that Christ has set for us. And if you belong to him, this table is for you. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ.